The Enscombs Quartet was created by Francis John Enscomb in 1973 and consists of four datasets, hence the name. Each of these datasets have 11 pairs of X and Y values. And when you look at their average X values and their average Y values, which you could do with the mean X or mean Y function, you will notice that for X they are identical and for Y they are identical for the first two decimal places and then only differ slightly on the third decimal place. And also the standard deviation of the X values is identical and is almost identical for the y values. But that's not enough. The correlation of x and y within each data set comes down to 0.816. But wait, there's more. If you were to create a linear regression of x and y values, so following this formula to predict y based on x with some multiplication coefficient, which would be the slope, and some intercept that you add, you would get identical coefficients for the linear model for each of these four data sets and an almost identical R square, which is the variance explained. So now with all these summary statistics being almost identical across the four data sets, you might wonder how similar they are to each other. And you might be surprised to see that when you actually plot them, they look quite different. And that's exactly the point that Francis John Anscombe wanted to get across. He was an English statistician and he wanted to show the importance of actually graphing the data when analyzing it and the effect that the outliers or influential observations can have on statistical properties. Now the three lessons that you can learn from this data set are one, how to actually calculate the summary statistics and model parameters in R. And I will show you different levels of skill and comprehension. So we will start with the new way where you will use indexing on the data frame and the actual function to calculate these different statistics. Then I show a first improvement when you can use the apply functions and then it gets even more automated with a for loop. And in the end, I will show you some helpful deploy up functions like pivot wide or group by and summarize. Secondly, I will show you how to visualize these data sets quickly. So going from a basic scatter plot to this advanced chart where we add colors, separate the data sets, change the titles and adding regression lines and also removing the axis labels. And the third lessons you can learn from these data sets relate to linear regression. The first chart is what you would expect of fitting a straight line through pairs of X and Y values that have some relationship to one another and where you could then predict additional Y values based on X. I will also show you how to deal with underfitting where the dots actually follow a quadratic function or a polynomial one and then we will go into analytics of linear regression that deal with influential values either to notice outliers that move the line that would actually perfectly fit the points away from the real trend by looking at the Cook's distance and then we will investigate leverage which relates to points that are far away from the other points and have an unusual influence on the model that we're fitting. If you like this content subscribe to the channel and give the video a thumbs up. And without further ado, let's get to the R code. First, you have to install the hist data package, which you can do with the install packages function. And then you load it with library. When you type enscomp, you will get this data frame that consists of 11 observations. That's the rows and eight variables, which comes in pairs of four X values and four Y values, indicating the different data sets. You can use the view function to look at it in this table format, where you could then sort by X values. And you see for the first three data sets, X is the same for all cases, just for the fourth one. The X values are always the same and then with one point far away. You should be familiar with indexing where you add a dollar sign to the data frame and then just select the column you're interested in and that will spit out the X1 values, so the first column. And you could now use the mean function to calculate the average of that vector. And you could do the same with the second vector to get your results. If you want to get the standard deviation, you use the SD function and you could separate the different function calls with a semicolon and then they come out one after another. And there is a function that makes it a little bit easier called call means, which will give you the averages of all the different columns and the eight columns result in eight results for the X values always nine. And then the Y values are almost identical except for the third data set. Now, if you want to calculate the correlation between X1 and Y1, you can use the core function and then you would repeat that for the other three data sets leading to very similar correlations. So for the first three decimal places, they are the same. And you see that it would be a bit repetitive to get all of these results. But sometimes as a beginner, it's okay to do it that way because you at least know exactly what you're doing and you don't have to learn complicated functions like apply or for loops. But it comes with a risk of producing typos and not noticing them. And also for the future, 
whether you want to become more advanced in automating your code and producing results quickly. So a linear model you could do by extracting y1 and trying to predict it against x1 from the data set. It would give you the results. A bit cleaner way is to just use the variables, the column names y1 predicted based on x1 for the formula and then specify the data frame that holds these two variables and it would give you the same result. Now if you use the summary function on that linear model you get a bit more information. It gives you the function call again, information on the residuals and then the estimation coefficients. So before we only got the intercept and the slope which we're still getting but now it comes with a standard error, a t value and a p value talking about how significant these values are and the slope estimate of 0.5 is highly significant with a p value below 0.01. You have some stars indicating the significant codes and it will also give you the r square value which explains the variance. But that's not all. The summary gives you this information but in the background there's actually a lot more information included in the Lydia model. With str you get the structure of the results and it tells you that there's a list of 11 items. Some of these list items hold many more attributes and information and it also tells you how to access that information. So with dollar sign coefficients you get the coefficients of the linear model, you can extract the residuals and then later plot them and you can access r squared values. There's one small difference if you run str on the linear model directly and not on a summary instead of 11 list items you get 12 and they also come in a slightly different order. So now with dollar sign coefficients you can extract the intercept and the slope of the model and if you use dollar coefficients on the summary version of the linear model you would get more information like the standard arrow t value and p value and if you're then only interested in the first column you would use the square brackets comma one to extract the first column values. Also the r squared is only available on the summary version of the linear model and you can extract it with the dollar sign r dot squared. So now if you use the base approach you would have to replicate this for data set 2, 3 and 4 and then write down the values. But now I want to show you how you can speed up that process. So when you type in apply it will tell you that you need a capital X, a margin and a function. And the X is the data frame, a matrix or an array. The margin tells you if you want to apply the function column wise or row wise. One indicates rows and two indicates columns. And then the function stands for what you actually want to do. When you use nscomp the data frame for X, margin two meaning column wise and function equals mean, it will give you the column means of all the different columns. Previously we did that with the call means function but now we can change the function to sd for standard deviation and extract all the values quickly. If you only want the y values you could specify that for the x argument by only selecting the columns with y values and there's also a way to produce both results simultaneously by creating a function x following the fun function argument and then with curly braces include combined vector of mean x and standard deviation x that you then assign to named arguments like sd and mean and then it comes out with both results simultaneously. Next I want to show you the option with the for loop. For that I want to create a vector called res core which would be the results for the correlation that is created and currently just holds four NAs. And now you build a for loop by starting with the for function and having any placeholder. This could be a, b or whatever. So usually people use i and you want i to take on one, two, three and four as values and i will cycle through these. And for testing we can set i to one and use that on the first column of the NSCOM data set. So this is x1 values with the double square brackets. That's a way to access it. You could also do this with the single square brackets. The idea behind it is that a data frame in R is also a list and this list holds eight columns of identical length and you can access the first list entry with the double square brackets and one. And then we know that the first y value column is at the fifth position but we cannot write five because we want this to then become the sixth, seventh and eighth position so we just use i and add four. So this would lead to a correlation between x1 and y1 of 0.8164 and now this result we would store in the formally created res core vector at position i which is the first position 
and this would lead to rest core looking like this and the for loop runs through one two three and four and fills the rest core vector by producing the four different correlations now for the linear model i created not a vector to hold the results but an actual data frame with the data set one two four and then three columns of na entries so currently those are empty but i'm planning to now put in the intercept slope and r squared values of these four different data sets simultaneously in another for loop. If you would type i again, it has now the value of 4 because it just looped through the 1 to 4 vector. And we know that we can now create a temporary linear model that holds the results of the linear model where we predict the y values based on x. And here I prefer the formula to actually look like this and not like this because now we can access these columns directly to produce the linear model. And first we predict y1 based on x1 and store the result results summary in temp lm. Let's just do that for i equals 4. We see now that temp lm has all the results from the linear model and now we have to extract specific values and store them in the rest data frame. So we could look at the temp lm dollar coefficients to get the intercept and the slope and in rest data frame we have two columns called intercept and slope and for the data set 4 this would have to go into the fourth row but we will use i and not 4 because it needs to loop through these different rows and then we specify the column names so this would now be row 4 column 2 and 3 and there we write in these coefficients and then we do the same for our squared values which we access with dollar r dot squared and we store it in the last column of the rest data frame called r underscore squared. Then we close the curly brackets and run the for loop. And now when you look at the results data frame, you see for data set one, two, three, and four, the different intercepts, four different slopes, and then four r square values. Now I want to show you some very powerful dplyr functions that allow you to calculate these summary statistics for all four different datasets really fast. You have access to these functions by loading the tidyverse or dplyr package and we will also need the stringer package for some string extractions. Then you pipe the ANSCOM dataset into the pivot longer function with columns equal everything. It will start to collect all of the information from the eight different columns. So first you will get 10 from x1, 10 from x2, etc. 8.04 from y1, and then it goes to the next row collecting the next x1 item 8 and then another 8 from x2. I then want to use the mutate function to add two extra columns, a dataset column and a variable column. The dataset column should say 1, 2, 3 or 4 and the variable column should hold x or y values. The latter we accomplish by using the string extract function from the stringer package where we look into the name column and from each string or character value that's there we extract a certain pattern namely the letters a to z which you choose by this expression in square brackets. So then there would be an extra column called variable that holds x and y values but I also want to create the dataset column and this we can do with the case when function. So we Whenever we detect the string pattern 1 in the name column, we will create an entry called dataset1. And you can see that this works. And now we just have to repeat that three more times. And with this code, we turn the wide ANSCOM dataset with eight columns into four columns, but now many more rows. And in the end, I want to have only three columns where one is the dataset, and then you have a value for X and a value for Y. And to accomplish that, we need to use the pivot wider function. And this will only work if there is an additional unique identifier that I create with ID and that just repeats one to 11 eight times, because there are 11 X values for dataset one, 11 y values for data set 1 etc. So now you can see the id holds the row information so to speak. These values all came from the first row and then it continues with the second row and we can save that in a long data frame and this I want to pipe into the pivot wider function and now we don't need the name variable anymore because we extracted the data set information and the x or y information and within pivot wider I want to split based on the variable so take the names from here turn it into x or y and and then attach the values to that, which would give you this result. So now the IDs are still here, the data set and X and Y values. And lastly, 
I want to arrange them by data set and then ID. So now this is the clean long data frame XY with 11 pairs of XY values for data set one, data set two, three, and four. We save that in this new object, long data frame XY. And now we can do these calculations really quickly. We use the group by function to let R know that now all the calculations are supposed to be done for data set one and then repeated for two, three, and four. And we use summarize to execute these calculations. First, calculate the average of X values so it will look into the x column and calculate the mean or to be more precise four means for group data set one two three and four then we follow up with the standard deviation for x then we repeat this with mean y and sdy and if you don't use the equal sign to create a results name it will create a name automatically by putting the function itself into quotes and you will see that in a minute then we can store the correlation between x and y in a core underscore x y variable we can calculate the intercept by producing the linear model between y and x and then extracting the first coefficient which was the intercept the second coefficient was the slope and as a reminder to get r squared you have to include the linear model within the summary function to extract that information and then you simply run the code and you can view the last value that's produced by your code in this way. And now you see for each data set, you get average x, standard deviation x. And as I said, if you don't use equal sign, it will put the function call into quotes and produce its own name, mean y, sdy. Here's the correlation. You have the intercept, slope, and the variance explained, r squared. And it's just really clean programming. It needs a little bit data manipulation to put a white data frame into a long format, but then with the grouping of data sets, it's really nice to write down. I'm not going to go into too much details. There probably will be a dedicated video on pivot longer, pivot wider, but what we did here with pivot longer and then all these mutations with string extract and renaming with case when, you would get the same result by addressing many of these renamings and pattern recognitions within the pivot longer function, where this will automatically turn it into X and Y columns for the different data sets. Next, I want to show you how to visualize the data. ggplot is included in the tidyverse package, but you can also load it directly. And then in the ggplot function, you do the aesthetics mapping, where you simply put x and y values on the coordinates. So x and x and y on y. We pipe the data frame into the ggplot function. And then after ggplot, everything you write down needs to be followed by a plus sign and not the piping characters. So after the aesthetics mapping is done, we add a geom, in this case points, increasing the size a little, making it a bit more transparent. And then if you want to get rid of this gray, you can apply the theme light and it looks a bit cleaner. So now it plots all of the data points, 44 pairs, in one chart, but we already know that these belong to four different data sets. First, we can include this information in the aesthetics mapping by assigning the data set variable to color. And now you can see the four different data sets being colored differently. Maybe we should get rid of the alpha because now you can detect the overlapping points based on the colors. And the first thing I want to do is make use of the facet wrap function till the data set which will split this chart into four charts, one for each data set, which now looks like this. Now we don't need the legend anymore. We can remove it with the theme function and giving the legend.position function argument character none. So now the legend is removed, but we still have the information in the title of each individual chart. Then we can get rid of this y and x axis label with the labs function, where we just delete the text and we can give it a title. If you use subtitle, then the font size will be a little bit smaller. And now there are two ways to add a regression line. One is to use the geom app line function where you can provide the slope and the intercept values and it will just produce this line. But what I usually use is the geom smooth function that will fit a line through the data points. And if we want to limit that to a straight line, we would set method to LM for linear model. And the ribbon that you see around the regression line indicates uncertainty. So when you have fewer data points, the standard error of your estimation gets wider. And by default, the standard error is set to a 95% confidence interval, but we can just set it to false to get rid of it entirely. Now, if you want to change the labels of the plot, there are two options. One is using the labeler function from ggplot, where within facet wrap, you can rename the labels of dataset one, two, three, and four. You just combine different pairs where you start with the original and then set that to a new name, and then it will overwrite the original names. 
But what I usually do is using mutate to create a new column called dataset underscore name, where I use case when and ask if the dataset is equal to dataset one, call that linear regression, etc. And then when I run the plotting code again, I will change the color from dataset to dataset name and also facet wrap to dataset name. Now, unfortunately, it would change the order of the plots. So the plot with the outlier is now the first one because it reorders them alphabetically. And if you don't want that, you can simply turn this new column into a factor where the levels follow a specific order. And if you execute this code and run it again, now it comes in the order of the levels of this new factor. Now that you know about the importance to visualize your datasets and how to do that in R, I want to talk a little bit more about linear regression. The first dataset represents the normal case where you fit a line across points to visualize a relationship between y and x values and some points are above the line and some are below and some are on the line. The second dataset represents a case of underfitting where the relationship between x and y doesn't follow a linear trend but a quadratic formula. And then the third and the fourth data set represent highly influential points that can be outliers, but they have a strong influence over the best fit. So without this point, the line would go directly through all of the other points. And this deviation from the rest of the points in the y direction can be summarized with the Cook's distance. And in this case, this point has a high leverage because on the x axis, it's far away from all the other points. And it suggests falsely that there is a x y relationship that when you increase x y increases but in reality there is no such relationship because the y values differ independently of x. Nonetheless all of these points lead to the identical linear regression and now I want to show you how you can use R to detect influential points or underfitting. We start with a normal linear regression so we fit the y1 values to the x1 values from the dataset ANSCOMP. We store the results in this lm underscore one object and if we use the sum function on that object, we get the slope and the intercept estimates, some significant scores, and the R squared value telling us that the regression explains 66.6% .6 of the variation. And based on these estimates, you would be able to predict a y value based on any x value by simply multiplying the x value by 0.5 and adding 3 from the intercept. Now, when you use the plot function on a linear model, it gives you four diagnostic plots, and you can click through them by pressing return or enter and they're mostly based around the residuals. The residuals are the values that you have when you subtract the actual y value of a dot from the predicted y value of this dot. Therefore some residuals will be negative, some will be positive because they are above the predicted value and some will be very close to the predicted value and they should follow a normal distribution. So the first plot represents this, the residuals versus the fitted or predicted values. Many are close to zero, some are above and some are below. Then it produces a normal QQ plot based on theoretical quantiles and standardized residuals and these should follow this dotted line which in this case they roughly do. Then it turns the residuals into only positive values by using this absolute sign and putting a square root around it. So now you only have positive values and they are really small but if there would be an outlier the point would be far away from the others. And the fourth plot looks into the leverage which is entirely based on x values and it tells you how far away the x values are from the center of the x values and here the Cook's distance is included to show you if points are within a certain metric. So this funnel here between 0.5 and 0.5 holds all of the points so there's no real outlier based on Cook's distance or leverage. Now the problem with the first data set is that there are only 10 data points so you cannot really see the normal distribution of the residuals but if you sort them you see that there are some close to minus 2 and some close to plus 2. So let us quickly produce a test linear regression based on a bigger sample size. Here I just produce 100 x values and have a slope of 0.5 and then add some noise. So just produce 100 points that follow the standard normal distribution and then I multiply it by 2 to increase the variance a bit. So when you plot x, y this is what we produced. And now I produce the linear model, show you the summary and if we look at the residuals now with the histogram you can see the normal distribution and if you use the plot to look at the four summary metrics it shows you that everything looks normal and now the QQ plot is a bit clearer following this dotted line. So now let's move on to the second data set where we 
are supposed to fit a quadratic linear model. If you don't know that, you would predict y2 based on x2 and you get the same estimate of intercept and slope with the same degree of variance explained. But if you now look at the plots of the linear model, the first one already gives it away that now the residuals versus the fitted values follow this quadratic equation shape where the first ones are below the line, then are some above the regression line and then they are below the line again, just as it looked here. This would also be represented in a normal QQ plot, some below, some above, some below, but with only 11 data points it's not completely clear. The scale location chart also looks not too straight but a bit bumpy. But now the question is how can you actually fit a line through the dots that represent this quadratic relationship? There are three ways to do that in R. One is by producing an additional column x2 quad that is just the x2 values squared. And now you can produce a linear model that we can call quadratic where we predict q2 based on x2 but additionally also on this x2 quad column. And now when you look at the summary of this quadratic model you get an intercept, an estimate for regular x and an estimate for x squared and now r squared is 1 so we can explain 100% of the variance with this formula. When you enter the coefficients into Wolfram alpha so the estimate for the x squared term plus the estimate of the x term and the intercept you get this quadratic shape which from 5 to 15 would be the second data set and this is exactly the curve that would go through all of the points. If you plot the data and use GeoSmooth it would go directly through the dots because it's not limited to linear model. It would use the Lewis function by default. If you set it on being a linear model you would get a line with some error bars now and if you would set the standard error to false the ribbon goes away and it's just showing the line but this is not the fit to that we now expect from the quadratic solution. And in R there's a predict function where you can put in x values. So here I create a data frame based on x values that go from 5 to 13 with some in-between steps. And the predict function will use a linear model or the quadratic model that we fitted here above. And it will calculate which y value would exist if it follows this model. And you hand over a list of x values and x squared values and it will produce the predicted y values. So now every x has a y y and we can plot that and from 5 to 13 the light green color represents the predicted values based on the quadratic model that we produced here. So that's the first way to do it. Produce an additional column with x square values and then use that within the linear model. There are two other ways to do it. One is by using this i function. It stands for as is and it inhibits the interpretation or conversion of objects. So the linear model where we predict what y based on x and x squared would now go in in the linear model and x squared would exist as x squared. So this i forces these value to be an expression of the squared x values. And if you produce this lm underscore i model, the summary of the model now give you the same coefficients for intercept for the estimate that goes in front of the x value and then the estimate that's multiplied with the x square values. Just as in this formula, we had a value to multiply x squared and a value to multiply with regular x to produce this shape. And that's an easier way to do it. And the third way is to use the polynomial function where it knows that y is predicted based on x but with two degrees, so x squared and regular x. And for the poly function, you can set raw to be true or false. If you use true, then the first degree, the intercept and the second degree are the estimates that we have seen before now twice. If you set this to false, then they look a little bit different, but they would produce the same y values. This might sound a little bit confusing, but there's a nice stack overflow thread that talks about the poly function and the importance of setting raw to true. And the difference is raw polynomials are the ones that we're familiar with in equations as terms for the x square and the regular x. But if you set raw to false, you produce orthogonal polynomials, which have other advantages. 
because if you go from 2 degrees to 3 degrees, the first 2 degrees would not change, but you add a third degree estimate. If you set polynomials to raw, then with 3 degrees, all of the estimates would look different. And there's another thread in mass overflow that explains the difference. I link to both in the description below if you're more interested in the math behind fitting polynomials. So regardless of whether you set raw to true or false and produce poly raw or poly, the predict function would use either of these fitted models to produce y values based on the x sequence. So the predict function works with the raw polynomials and the orthogonal ones. And the proof is here. We add orange points based on the poly prediction. Now we move on to the third data set where the Cook's distance plays a role. And if you sort the residuals from the linear model 3, where we predict y3 based on x3, you can see that there are some negatives that get close to zero. There are some positives, but then there's one that is already at 3.2. So much further away from zero than what you would expect. You can use the Cook's distance function on this data set and it will tell you that the third point is a little bit suspicious. And for y3, the third point was the one that's way higher than the rest. And if we plot these four charts, you can see that the fitted versus the residuals is perfect for all of the points except the third one. The normal QQ looks weird and indicates that point 3 is an outlier. Same for the scale location, one point deviating from the red line. And now the Cook's distance is the dotted lines here. And there's one point that's outside a Cook's distance of 1.0, which would warrant the removal of this point. There's no problem with the leverage because all of these points are similar on the x-axis. There's no one point that's further away than the rest of them. I mean, there are many points close to the center and then it increases slightly in both directions. And that's what you see here, that there are points close to the center and then it increases, but there's not a single point that's really far away from all of the others. I will also link to the Wikipedia article, but as I said, it's an estimate of the influence of a data point when you do linear regression. It was introduced produced by Dennis Cook in 1977 and it shows you points that are worth checking for validity. Now we come to the last point, the leverage, and as I said, it's a measure of how far away the independent variable, so the x-axis values, are away from those of the other observations. So when you use plot on a linear model, the first chart already gives it away that all of the points have the same x-value except for one, so that would indicate a high leverage. For the second plot, the normal QQ, it looks quite regular, but that's because all of the residuals follow a normal distribution. You have some that are on the line and then they increase in both directions. Some are above, some below. That's a normal pattern for a linear regression. But then for the last plot, residuals versus leverage, you get this warning message that it's not plotting observation with leverage 1 and it tells you that this is observation 8. It's so far away from the center of all the other x values that it's not included in the chart. And value 8 you can see has the x value 19 all of the others are at 8 so the center of the x values is close to 8 these points deviate by 0.1 from that center but this one is so far away that it gets the maximum leverage of 1 and hence should be removed i hope you liked this video it was a bit different from the ones i did before but i think it's quite educational to learn about data manipulation, producing summary statistics, plotting the data, and then learning a bit more about linear models. And I'm looking forward to seeing you at the next video here at the Data Digest. Bye bye.